Okie dokie, welcome back ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today we're going to talk about the first couple of phyla of animals. And basically the phyla we're going to go in order is the order of biological complexity. And that's kind of how we're going to treat it. So that means that all the chordates, um, so that's the big vertebrates and stuff like that, those are going to be in part three of this lecture series for animals. So we're going to start off with um, the basic definitions of animals. And as a, remind you, uh, a reminder, animals are heterotrophic, eukaryotic, and multicellular, and they lack cell walls, except for one, but there's always an exception that proves the rule. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. 95% of all animals are invertebrates, which means they do not have a backbone. 5% of all the organisms uh, that are animals, are in that kingdom, are vertebrates. So all of the big things when I say animal that you generally think of, like cats, dogs, lions, giraffes, etc., um, those are all vertebrates, so that composes only 5% of the animal kingdom. There are several trends in animal ev evolution. Uh, cell specialization and levels of organization uh, increase as you move into more evolutionarily developed phyla. Um, so we go from basic cells, which would be the protists, uh, specifically the protozoans, to the tissue level, which is where we're going to start with some animals, organs, and then finally organ systems. Animals are also characterized by their uh, symmetry. Body symmetry means it's the body plan of an animal or how its parts are arranged. So if it's asymmetric, it has really no pattern. You can't split it in half and make, you know, a left side and a right side. That would be the same. Um, some corals are like this, and many of the sponges are asymmetrical. And typically, you only see asymmetry in animals that do not move, that are sessile, at least as adults. Radially symmetric are ones that are shaped like a wheel or a pizza or however you want to think about it, which means that you can cut it along one plane and you'll have a left and a right side that are even. You can put it along a different plane and you still have a left and a right side that are even. So um, starfish are radially symmetric, hydras are radially symmetric, jellyfish are. Um, and then finally we have bilateral symmetry, which means you have a definite right and left side. There's only one way to cut uh, the organism in half to make a left and a right side. And remember, I'm saying cut in half visually, not actually cut it in half. Um, so humans, insects, cats, etc., those are all bilaterally symmetric. With bilateral symmetry also came the development of cephalization. And cephalization means that you have an anterior concentration of sense organs. In other words, Anterior means toward the head, so you start to have a head with brains and stuff like that happening um, in one location. You'll see that some animals have brains all over their bodies and some of them don't even have those. The more complex animal becomes, the more pronounced the cephalization. And the most advanced cephalization happens in many of the mammals and birds. Okay, a couple of things that you need to remember, some terms, because I'm going to use them a lot. Anterior means toward the head, posterior means toward the tail. When you're talking about a human who's standing up, anterior is your belly side and posterior is your back side, um, not just necessarily your butt. Dorsal is the back and ventral is the belly. So for us, anterior and posterior are the same thing because we're not on all fours. Um, or anterior and ventral and posterior and dorsal are the same thing. But in most animals, it's different. So if you take a look at this picture of the elephant, for example, anterior is where its head is, posterior where its tail is, uh, dorsal is its back, and ventral is its belly side. Some other animal trends include um, moving to a more complex digestive system. Um, the first animals, the earliest animals, have diffusion only, so they actually diffuse nutrients across their cells. Um, that's pretty slow and pretty inefficient. Some have sac-like or incomplete digestive systems, like the jellyfish here, and um, what that means is that the mouth and the anus are the same thing. Uh, it goes in and goes out the same opening. 
And then we have the development of complete digestive systems, which means you have a mouth and a separate anus, and the food travels through one way. And that's the most complex digestive system in generic terms. Um, complexity also increases as you go up, generally. Segmentation um, is something that happens, and that'll be toward the end of this lecture. Seg advanced animals tend to have body segments and specialization of tissues. Even we, as human beings, are segmented. If you take a look at our ribs or our spinal column or the abdominal muscles, you can see those segments. We also have a development of body cavities, which are a fluid-filled space where internal organs can be suspended. And there's a couple of different kinds, and we'll talk about those. So one of the things to help you with this material, and it's really important that you do that, is that you make this chart. So please make a chart just like this. And you're going to have the phylum, what kind of symmetry it has, what type of feeding, unique characteristics of that phylum, the evolutionary milestone represented by that phylum, and then some examples of organisms in that phylum. Because this is very much the cubby-holing part of biology, too. This is where we go, here's, here's a group, here's some examples, etc. Okay, so we're going to start off with the least complex group, and that is phylum periphera, which are the sponges. And some of them are quite lovely, as you can see here. So sponges really have their success in their simplicity. They have an asymmetric body with no true tissues and no true organs, so they truly show the cellular level of organization. They have two layers of body cells, and inside those two layers, between them, is a semi-fluid matrix with needle-like uh, structures called spicules, which are characteristic to the group. Spicules, by the way, is spelled S-P-I-C-U-L-E-S. Spicules um, are used primarily for support. They also have specialized cells called collar cells, and they line the interior chambers of the sponge. And these collar cells have flagella on them, so they beat the flagella, and the cells will move large volumes of water in through the body pores and out through the large opening at the top of the body. So they kind of suck it in all from all sides on the sides, and then they send it out through the top hole um, or holes at the top of the body. And you can see that, especially with the little round sponges over here on the right-hand side. Um, that top hole is called the osculum, which means mouth, kissing mouth specifically. So the collar cells not only move the water, but they also trap suspended food particles in their collars and then transfer the food to different kinds of cells that look like amoeba. And uh, they're the ones that actually uh, move around the matrix and transfer nutrients to the places it needs to go. Um, sponges also have skeletal spicules. Some of them, like the glass sponges, hexactinellidae, um, have really, really sharp spicules or very brittle ones that will damage predators. Um, they can also create chemical secretions to, to deter predators as well. Sponges are a group that can reproduce sexually or asexually. If they produce sexually, they release sperm into the surrounding water and it gets picked up by a nearby sponge and directs directs it to the egg within the matrix, so that jelly-like fluid between the two layers of body cells. And the zygote will develop into a larva that will swim. So it will emerge, the larva will emerge, it will swim away from the parent sponge and then land and then develop into the sessile, in other words, non-moving, adult sponge. Sponges, if they reproduce asexually, will reproduce by budding, which means that they form kind of little a uh, baby sponge off the side, and it eventually drops off and forms its own in individual parent. Um, they can also produce, some freshwater sponges will also produce uh, resistant gemules, which means that it's kind of like seed coats. They'll, they'll sit dormant and uh, wait for a good opportunity to develop. Okay, so that's the sponges. Now we're going to go on to the next group, the Nidarians. The sea is silent. Um, nidarian means sping stinging animals, and their 
big organization level is that they have simple tissues, but they do not have organs yet. So cnidarians are tentacled and radially symmetric. This group will include jellyfishes, sea anemones, and hydrozoans. Nidarians have very simple body plans. The medusa resembles an umbrella and floats like tentacle-fringed bell in the water, and they have oral arms surrounding the central mouth. So that's one body plan, which typical jellyfish you think of is a medusa. The polyp is tube-like and is usually attached to some substrate, and it can be a part of a colony or it can be solitary. So if you think of a sea anemone, which is a type of nadarian, that's a polyp form. So basically it's kind of the same form, it's just one's upside down, one's right side up. In the nadarians they have a digestive cavity, um, but it is sac-like. It pretty much has only a mouth, so it goes in and out in the same orifice, and uh, they can accommodate prey that's larger than the nadarian itself, so they can swallow things bigger than them. They have an outer tissue layer called the epidermis that covers the body, and they have an inner tissue layer called the gastrodermis, gastro means stomach, and it lines the digestive cavity. Nadarians have a simple nervous system called a nerve net, and it runs through both layers and it coordinates the animal's response to stimuli. So they can, you know, suck in their tentacles and hide. They can release their stinging cells to attack prey, etc. Some jellyfishes will also have sensory cells and contractile cells. Some nadarians that have, for example, mutualistic relationships with algae have basic light sensing organs and they can move toward the light. All nadarians have a jelly-like mesoglia. It's kind of like the jelly that makes up jellyfish. Um, and it lies between the outer and inner body layers, so between the epidermis and the gastrodermis. Jellyfishes have abundant mesoglia helping to provide buoyancy, and it helps for the, mus the little contractile cells to contract against to help them to swim. Polyps, though, the polyp form has very little mesoglia, but they use the water in their guts as a hydrostatic skeleton. Now, this phylum is called the stinging celled animals, and here's how that works. Um, the stinging cells have a special name, and it's called a nematocyst, and they basically function just like a harpoon. So there's a trigger, um, and when it's triggered, the operculum, which is just a little flap, opens up and there's a spring-loaded barb on a thread and it will extend and lock in and you can see the barbs allow it to lock into the flesh of whatever they're stinging. Now jellyfish and their relatives do not go, oh that's not food, I shouldn't sting it. They can't think, so remember they only have a nerve net. So pretty much if you brush against the nematocysts then they discharge, and that's pretty much how that works. And so the nematocysts can sting you even if it's not even attached to the jellyfish anymore. So if you have a tentacle just floating by itself, it can still sting you. So jellyfish, like plants, have an alternation of generations. Nadarian life cycles show these alternation of life, uh, life stages. So the life cycle of a nadarian may have a polyp and a medusa sage, or it may just have the polyp. Some, some types don't have the medusa. The medusa is usually the sexual form, and it has the gonads, so it's going to reproduce sexually. The zygote will develop into a swimming larva called a planula, and it will swim away and develop. Many nadarians, however, grow as colonies and often, often will harbor photoautotrophic protists as little guests. So that's the nadarian group. You've got the examples and stuff like that. Make sure that as you're taking notes that you are keeping track of this stuff. Use that note form because it's going to really, really come in handy. Okay, the next group is the platyhelminthes. Platy means flat and helminth means worm. So these are the flatworms and uh, they have the simplest of the organ systems. So, you know, I said that the nadarians had the basic tissues, that was their big evolutionary development. Well, this one has organ systems. So organs form from three tissue layers called the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. 
the body of flatworms is flat, bilateral, and cephalized, which means that they have a definite head, and uh, but they do not have a coelom, so they don't have that fluid-filled body cavity to hold organs. Many species of flatworms are hermaphroditic, which means that they have both sexes in one body, but they do practice cross-fertilization. In other words, just because you're a hermaphrodite doesn't mean you can fertilize yourself. You have to have an, a, a partner. Turbularians, um, which are also called planarians, are free-living and aquatic. They have a sac-like gut with a single mouth opening through which a tube called the pharynx will extend for food gathering. So it's kind of like a real flexible tube and they kind of stick it out of their body and it kind of hoovers up what they're eating. But again, it's not a one-way digestive system, so anything they take in, they have to expel through that same or orifice. One of the big developments for this group is that they have protonephridia um, with cells that are specialized called flame cells, and these act like basically early kidneys. That's what protonephridia means, is that it means, you know, beginning of the kidney. Um, the flame cells regulate body fluid volume and composition, so it works just like our kidneys do. Many of these flatworms can also asexually reproduce. Um, so, for example, if you take a regular planarian, uh, uh, which is common in sewage systems and stuff like that, uh, if you cut them in half, they'll develop into two different flatworms, so they can also reproduce asexually through transverse fission. Flukes, which you see here on the bottom left, um, flukes are internal parasites that require a primary host, like a human for sexual reproduction and an intermediate host, which are most often snails and their relatives, for development. And we classify flukes based on where we find them. So this one on the on the bottom left is Clonorchis, which is the sheep's liver fluke. So guess where it lives? Tapeworms, which are up at the top left, um, are intestinal parasites of vertebrates. They absorb pre-digested nutrients from the host because they have no digestive tract of their own. And the body consists of an anterior scolex, which is the head, solely for the attachment to the host's gut. Okay, so that's all the head does. It doesn't think, it just attaches to the gut wall. And if you're wondering which one is the head, if you look at the very, very tiny little string-like thing, there's a little bulb at the end of the tiny string. That's the scolex. It's very small. So the scolex is for attachment to the host's gut, and it has a string of proglottids, which are those little segment-looking things, each of which possess both female and male organs. So they get shed with the feces of the host. So that's why if you suspect your dog might have tapeworms, the vet will ask you to look for things that look like little grains of rice, and those are actually the proglottids. And the proglottids, besides carrying both male and female organs, it can, carries all of the basic stuff that an entire new tapeworm needs. But it also carries 10,000 pre-fertilized eggs. Because when you live in the gut of an organism, you can't exactly go out and go to a tapeworm singles bar. you got to do it all by yourself. Okay, um, this one is a picture that I want you to spend some time on. I want you to... Um, label this body plan because it's important you know this you will have it on a quiz or on the test so here's your word bank and I'm going to go through these slowly and I want you to think about which one you'd label and I would recommend either printing a copy of this off your screen or drawing it yourself drawing it usually works a bit better so here's your word bank you have the oracle which is also known as the ear the eye spots brain, pharynx, nerve cord, the mouth, the excretory system, which is the flame cells, and the branch of the gastrovascular cavity or intestines. Okay, so make sure that you've reviewed this and that you've labeled it on your own sheet. Some of the problems with this group, um, platyhelminths, other than the turbularians, which are free-living, 
the rest of them are parasitic. And the parasitic flatworms of the class Trematoda, which are the flukes, they have oral suckers, and sometimes those suckers are supplemented by hooks so they can really attach in on a vertebrate host. Trematoda of, uh, trematodes of the order Digenea have complex life cycles involving two or more hosts. That's what the Digenea means, two generations. The larval worms will occupy small animals, typically snails and fish, and the adult worms are the internal parasites of vertebrates. Do not think that this means you can avoid them by not eating fish or snails, because they will expand out of the preliminary host and they can burrow through your own skin and get in that way. Um, so the adult worms are internal parasites of vertebrates. Many spe species like the liver fluke, which is clinorchus, and the blood fluke, which is schistosoma, can cause serious diseases in humans. There's no mouth or digestive system in the flukes, and food is absorbed through their outer body wall called the cuticle. It's quite thick. Adults will live in the digestive tract of the vertebrates, and the larval forms will insist in the flesh of various vertebrates and invertebrates. And you can see that in this picture of uh, a piece of beef liver. Those white things that you see are the insisted larval forms of the liver fluke. In some species, the ripe proglottids filled with eggs will be shed in the feces. In others, the fertilized eggs will leave the adult host in the feces themselves. So sometimes it's a, a segment and sometimes it's the uh, eggs. If the eggs are consumed by an intermediate host, the life cycle will continue. Tapeworm species that infest human intestines as adults include Tania saginata, Tania solium, and the dwarf tapeworm, or Hymenolopsis nana, and the fish tapeworm, Diphalobotherium latum, and those can reach up to lengths of 50 feet. Now the thing of why I'm showing you the picture on the left, that's from a 1914 ad, I believe, and um, people then, and people still today, will deliberately infest themselves with tapeworms to lose weight. Um, what that does, though, is it can cause seriously harmful effects, not just losing weight, because they're not only stealing your nutrients, they're also stealing a lot of other things and can cause major disease down the line. Okay, the last group we're going to cover in this uh, lecture is the nematodes, or the roundworms. They're bilateral, and they possess a very slender, tapered body. But this is the, the reason this group is so important is that they have a complete digestive system, which means that it has a mouth and an anus, and food is processed continuously in one direction. Reproductive organs in this group lie in what's called a pseudocelum, or false coelom. So remember, the flatworms didn't have one. These guys have a false one. Um, the pseudocelum is filled with fluid, though, and it has a tough cuticle that covers and protects the body. This little worm right here is Cenoribdis elegans, and it's rather famous because it has a simplicity of body plan and a small genome. And, and it's really tiny. I mean, it's like a millimeter long. So it actually has, is an excellent organism for use in research study, especially genetics and longevity. Most roundworms are small and free-living, but some are parasitic on plants and animals. The upper left picture is trichinosis. And in trichinosis, you get it from under pork, undercooked pork. And the roundworm will move from the digestive tract of the host to insist in the muscles. But sometimes it also insists in the brain. And so it can cause some major damage or even death. So please cook your pork. Uh, the second one that's on the upper right that you see coming out of the man's foot is called the parasitic guinea worm. And it infects people... Uh, by living under their skin, and they have to be extracted very slowly by winding it on a stick. Um, so you pull it a little bit each day until it finally comes out. The problem with the guinea worm is that if you break the worm, it will retract into your skin. One, you're never going to get it back out, and two, it will cause massive tissue destruction until generally you have to have it amputated. Pinworms that you see on the bottom left uh, side are really common parasites in young children. In fact, 
if you ask your parent, maybe you had them because it's pretty common. Um, hookworm adults also live in the small intestine of their host. The reason pinworms are so common, they're, first of all, you pick them up by accidentally ingesting their eggs. But the reason why they're so insidious, and they can stay, you know, you can have a continuous cycle of pinworms for years, because what happens is um, they live in the upper small intestine, and uh, as they go down the small intestine, when you're asleep at night, they move south toward the rectum. And what happens is a, a child will, uh, in their sleep, scratch because the pins are actually these small thread-like filaments that they poke into the intestinal lining, and it's irritating. And so the child will actually reach back and scratch in their sleep, not knowing what they're doing. Of course, they're asleep. Um, but what happens is children very rarely wash their hands when they get up and go eat breakfast. And so when they eat breakfast, they've got those eggs that the adult has deposited in their fingernails usually. They eat their food with their hands and it, they re-ingest the eggs and then a whole new generation develops. Finally, loa loa. And you can see the little worm uh, pointed out with the arrow on this, di on this picture. It's a blood-dwelling nematode that is parasitic in humans. The adult worm will wander through the subcutaneous tissue, but is most obvious when it crosses the conjunctiva, the white, of the eye. And so its leading, it, its leading common name is the African eye worm. Uh, the bad part about those guys is that they will travel from one eye to the next, and you can feel it, and it's really, really painful. But the king of the roundworm infestations is this one, and that's elephantiasis. Elephantiasis is a severe swelling of the legs, usually the legs. It has happened in other lower extremities like testes. Uh, it's a popular one. Uh, it's a severe swelling of these legs due to the blockage of lymph flow and the small roundworms basically sit in the lymphatic ducts and it blocks the return fluid back to the heart and so the fluid just builds up and builds up and stretches the skin to the immense proportions that you see here. You can see that the, picture, the pictured person on the right leg has some elephantiasis, it's swollen, but nowhere near the grotesque swellings that you see on the left leg here. Um, this is something that's hard to avoid in countries where it's common because they are deposited in the saliva of mosquitoes when they bite you. So uh, with that happy image in your mind, I'm going to end this lecture and move on to the next set of animals in the next lecture. Have a great day and hopefully wash your hands.